Welcome back to part three. So we're still going through how air comes into our lungs um, with inhalation or inspiration. So basically, to bring air in, it needs to be a lower pressure. And we do that by making the volume bigger, right? So let's get our pen out again. Okay. And how we do that is we use our diaphragm and our intercostal muscles. So intercostal between the ribs. So the diaphragm, to make the space bigger, is going to contract down. And so it'll pull away, making the space bigger. Diaphragm contracts down. Increase the volume. Okay. So for exhale, it's the opposite. The diaphragm is going to relax up. Our rib cage is going to move down. And we're going to make that volume smaller, which makes the pressure high and forces air out from high to low. So if you want to measure the volumes of air moving in and out, you can use what's called spirometry, using a spirometer. It measures respiratory volumes. And so I won't make you memorize these different volumes, but you're changing very little volume when you're doing your regular tidal breathing. Um, think of like a tide going in and out. It's just your basic. After you do a tidal inhale, the most you can inhale is your inspiratory reserve volume. When you do a tidal exhale, the extra you can force out is your expiratory reserve volume. So between that tidal and the inhale gives you your vital capacity of how much air you can move. And then the residual volume is the amount still left in your lungs. And if you add all four of those together, you get the total lung capacity. And then you can take these volumes and you can uh, find those capacities. Okay. So we just covered that first respiratory process of pulmonary ventilation or breathing. So now let's look at the other processes going on here. So first, after we get the air in, we'll have external respiration at the alveoli. We just covered that. And then we've got the transport through the blood. And then we've got that internal respiration. So the left side of your heart is going to pump oxygenated blood out to the body tissues. And then at the capillaries there, you're going to have gas exchange. And that's the internal respiration. Um, I did notice on the last lecture that Students who didn't watch the lecture on heart anatomy did not do well on the lecture test portion of it. You can pretty much guarantee that these two build on each other and you could get questions again on how blood flows. So if you don't have that down, you'll want to review it. Right? Cool. This is a lovely summary view. So I want to go through and hit this pretty in depth. So this lovely picture shows the two circuits of blood flow. The right side of our pump is for the pulmonary circuit going to the lungs to pick up oxygen and drop off carbon dioxide. And then that goes to the left side of our heart, which is the pump for the systemic circuit that goes out to our body tissues and um, through the aorta and its branches and comes back through the vena cava. So let's go through blood flow again. And I'll start at the right atrium because that's usually where I like to start. So blood flow starts into the right atrium, deoxygenated blood, through the tricuspid, into the right ventricle, through the pulmonary valve or pulmonary semilunar valve, into the pulmonary trunk, which branches into the pulmonary arteries, going away from the heart. And then we've got our pulmonary capillaries, gas exchange, blood drops off, Carbon dioxide picks up oxygen, so now it's oxygenated, and returns to the heart through the pulmonary veins 
into the left atrium, through the bicuspid or mitral valve, into the left ventricle, through the aortic semilunar valve into the aorta, which will branch around, uh, and you can go to the abdominal aorta down or up through the carotids, and you'll get to those systemic capillaries where we're going to drop off the oxygen off for the tissues, and then uh, that's internal respiration, right? Oxygen goes to the tissues. They use that to make ATP in their mitochondria through cellular respiration. Carbon dioxide is a byproduct. It goes back into the blood, and that blood flow returns from the superior and inferior vena cavas, as well as the coronary sinus, into the right atrium again. Okay, and there you can see how thin those membranes are for gas exchange to allow for rapid diffusion. So now let's look at how we control breathing. We've got respiratory centers in the brain, and basically lower level function, your brainstem is going to do, right? And then we can override that using higher level brain centers. So let's move me up here so we can see this picture better. Our brainstem, we've got the medulla oblongata. The medulla has a uh, that breathing center, the respiratory center. So that's going to be low level functioning, unconscious, involuntary. It can be taken over by a couple different things. You can use the cerebral cortex. So when you think about breathing, I'm controlling it with the cerebral cortex. And then if I like gasp and surprise, that's the hypothalamus overriding. Okay. So to summarize what you would want to write down on this page, one, the medulla brainstem. You can also have cortical controls, cortex, that can take over. That's your voluntary. Now let's get on to, let's move me up here and some respiratory disorders. So first you've got the common cold. Um, this is caused by multiple viruses, which is why you can get it multiple times because each virus is gonna have different antigens on the outside. And so you're gonna need different immune cells um, in the adaptive system to be activated. And so there, those viruses, antibiotics don't work because they only work against bacterial um, diseases. And so here is what it looks like. There's some antigens on the outside that you can see. So next, influenza or the flu. It's also viral. There is two main categories. There's also a category C, so there's kind of three. But A and B are the ones that people talk about a lot, right? And so then those are described based on their subtypes, based on the antigenic receptors. So what antigens are present? So each year for the flu vaccine, they try to guess which of the virus types are gonna be the most common. And so they'll put those types of antigens into the vaccine so that you'll make memory cells against them. But if you see a different flu virus um, than that, then they don't really work. But if you do see the same one, you've got memory cells and you won't have symptoms. Uh, because these cause so much um, inflammatory response, you'll oftentimes have secondary infections You'll have clogging, uh, like pneumonia. You'll have water and mucus buildup in the lungs. The bronchi, they'll have um, the bronchioles will be inflamed and sinuses inflamed. And next, why does this move over? So very applicable right now is the SARS COVID-19 or the coronavirus. So this one we're still learning about, and I'm trying to use the most up-to-date information, but they might have found something new. It is zoonotic, which means it's transmitted between animals and people. So they're thinking that either this guy, a pangolin, or um, a bat species was the species that we got the disease from. You might not have heard of a pangolin before. They're African. Um, they're actually the most traded in the illegal wildlife trade, um, which is how they get to China so commonly. Um, they're beautiful. They're endangered because we're taking them out of their native habitat. 
um, issues, generally either asymptomatic or fever, cough, shortness of breath, breathing difficulties. Uh, but these are going to be worse when you've got um, other underlying issues like a respiratory disorder already um, or uh, you are immunocompromised. In that case, then you'll have more issues with fluid buildup, mucus buildup. That can lead to secondary infections. It can cause your respiratory system to be really inflamed and have poor um, airflow. And as you do that, that can lead to kidney issues and then it can lead to death. We're still learning a lot more about it. It's not a pleasant disease if you have symptoms, um, but we don't know a lot yet. Okay. And next, pneumonia. Don't understand this. Okay. So there you've got inflammation in the lungs. You've got fluid buildup. So important things here, if you have fluid and mucus buildup, you aren't going to be able to get that mucus out as well. Bacteria are going to stay in there more. Um, and you're also going to have decreased surface area to do gas exchange. So anytime you have damaged alveoli or they're clogged, you're going to be getting in less oxygen than normal. And more disorders. Strep throat, streptococcus aureus. Um, it's a bacteria, which is why they get you tested and get you on antibiotics if you have it. Um, you'll have swollen lymph nodes, tonsils, um, glands, fever. And then a very interesting disorder. If I can click there. Tuberculosis. So this is another bacterial infection uh, from a mycobacterium. And it is incredibly contagious. Incredibly contagious. Just like eight bacteria through the air into your um, respiratory system will cause the disease. So very low levels required, um, which is why it's so important that you get tested before you work in a healthcare environment or you travel because they don't want to spread it at all. And so if someone does get tuberculosis, you'll have these tubercles form on the lungs. You'll have this really heavy cough. It can be um, with blood as this tissue is damaged. Um, and it's long term. So if someone gets it, they'll put them on antibiotics, pretty strong ones, for about a year. Because if you still have any bacteria left, basically, you're going to have those rebuild up again after you stop taking antibiotics. So next we have cystic fibrosis, which is inherited. It's genetic. And that gene is for a chlorine channel. So what normally happens with those chlorine channels is we push chlorine onto the surface of that airway. And water wants to make the solute levels equal, so it moves out too. So our mucus is nice and watery and moves well. In cystic fibrosis, they don't have that chlorine channel, so there's very little water, and the mucus is really thick and doesn't move. And so that'll reduce um, the amount of air that can flow through. It'll also lead to secondary infections. Bacteria can get in there and grow really well. Next, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders. So this is like a big branch and there are different diseases in there. All of them have to do with irritation to your lung lining. So most often about 90% is from smoking tobacco. You can also have it from air pollution. So emphysema is the destruction of the alveoli. We don't have as much space to do gas exchange it'll be harder to get in enough oxygen, you'll have shortness of breath, and you can't fix it. And then last is lung cancer. So almost all of these cases are caused by smoking. You'll get this increase of irritation in the lungs. Those cells can start dividing rapidly, uncontrollably, and lead to cancer. Um, and then if it spreads to other areas, that's when you're going to have different stages, up to stage four. Um, and as we damage those linings, we aren't moving the cilia. It'll be harder to get lymphatic uh, capillaries to take things in as they get damaged. It's, it's rough. Okay, so here's this chapter. If you're listening to this still, thank you for sticking with it. And I appreciate you. Have a lovely day.